Dr. David Proben, he's the Managing Director of ForgeWorks Safety Consultancy and a part-time research fellow at Griffith University. He has a 20-year career as a safety executive across the rail, construction and oil and gas industries. His academic research interests include the operationalization of safety tool and resilience engineering and what it means for the current and future role of safety professionals within organizations. Um, he's also the co-host of the Safety of Work podcast with Dr. Drew Ray, which discusses safety science research findings in a practical way so that organisations can move further towards evidence-based practice. Um, now, Kim Bancroft is a passionate, future-driven health and safety leader, presenting more than 15 years' experience in the industry with a Master's in Applied Psychology and currently completing a Master's in Safety Leadership. Kim is the Head of Health and Safety at Queensland Urban Utilities. Taking a contemporary approach, Kim incorporates psychological principles and human-centred methodologies with safety innovation and evidence-based research to drive transformation across the workplace, creating high reliability operational excellence and a positive workplace culture. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much for joining us, David and Kim. Um, and I'll launch that poll too. Thanks, Sarah. What a, what a great introduction. Um, thanks to Myosh as well for hosting these, uh, these webinars. And we know for um, all of you who are listening now or who'll download this later that you've got lots of webinars to choose from at the moment. So thanks for um, making the time to listen to this today. So there's a poll right in front of you on your screen. We want to make this really targeted and really relevant to what you want to hear about. And we also want to make sure there's lots of time for discussion. So what we'd like to know is where you currently are on your safety two um, journey, to use a metaphor like that. Um, are you implementing safety two in your business? Are you trying to decide how to start implementing? Are you learning just about the, not just, but are you learning about the safety two ideas or, or, you know, only recently becoming aware of safety two. If you can, have a bit of a vote while I go through the agenda, then um, then we'll just make sure we can reorientate and pitch the conversation to suit everyone. So Kim, if you bring up the agenda for us, um, we sort of, there's six parts to this. We're gonna bounce back and forward. I'm gonna provide just some really summary theory because by now people just really wanna listen and hear and understand how to try to do this in their businesses. So I'll provide a brief theoretical overview just for some background and then Kim will tell you all about how she went and got started um, at Urban Utilities. Then we'll talk about, um, you know, some of the key things in safety too, understanding work is done and how we enable um, successful work. And Kim will again tell you um, the things that QU have done uh, in that space. We're going to try and take less than half the time talking and um, half the time kind of listening and responding to what you all have to say. Um, Sarah, can you see if you can give us some answers? Um, Okay. All right. All right. Yep. So, so not really that helpful in terms of being, a, being quite a reasonable spread. Um, so look, okay. Okay, great. So look, we've got 15 people who are implementing safety too. So please um, let this, let's, um, let's some really good practice orientated discussion going at the end. Um, people ready to go. Um, so half of, half of the people listening are ready to go or going and half of the people are trying to understand how it might fit for them and their organizations. Um, so that's good. Thanks, um, Sarah. That's um, really interesting. Nice spread. So if we go on to the first slide, so where, where did Safety 2 come from and, and what are we talking about when we talk about Safety 2? Um, Safety 2 has its roots in the early 1980s. So even though we're talking about just getting started now in industry, this is a, this is a sort of a 40-year academic journey around thinking about human performance and human error in complex systems. And it, and it really emerged after Three Mile Island and a lot of incidents that occurred in the 80s. And we saw high reliability organization theory and um, we, then we saw re resilience engineering. And about a decade or, or a little bit longer ago, Eric Holnagel uh, labeled this set of ideas as it's applied to the safety of complex systems as safety too. In a way of contrasting this thinking or... or um, differentiating this thinking from traditional safety management practice in, let's say, um, post-World War II organizations, uh, which was then labeled as by default as safety one. So we saw some papers come out as safety one versus safety two and um, what's the difference. And that probably was the starting point for some um, um, separation in schools of thought in the safety management space that everyone on the, on the line is going to be aware of. But what safety two is really about is applying a bigger perspective and a broader perspective to understanding 
um, our organizations and understanding how things work or don't work in relation to our business. So I don't think it was ever, well, I know it was never Eric's intention to make Safety 2 uh, in competition with Safety 1. Safety 2 was meant to expand our perspective beyond our traditional toolkit for how we think about safety. So Safety 1 um, looks for problems. It, um, it, it plans and prescribes how work should happen, and then it gets all surprised when things don't comply or when incidents occur. And then a lot of the effort is on detecting and repairing, um, as Dave Woods would say, you know, so the role of safety people are to be this detect and repair mechanism for the organization, spot the problems and um, bring work back into alignment with um, the plans and the procedures. And this is this, and people would know this is sort of early um, thinking from the um, early 20th century around how to manage production lines and, and so on. But our systems are far more complex than that now. And um, Eric says that, well, things normally go well, things normally go right. So our focus should be on understanding why why these things go well and why these things go right and how we can support things to go right more of the time. And if you think about that, that makes perfect rational sense. Um, I want to have a broader perspective. I want to understand the whole system. I want to understand my strengths and why my organization works most of the time. And I want to do whatever I can to make that happen more often. Um, but organizations aren't always that rational. And we find ourselves in, in a space now where um, organization, some organizations are finding it hard to, to change the way that they think about safety and also finding it hard to put some of these um, broader perspectives into practice. And that's where um, Kim's going to jump in right now as someone who has um, been doing that and um, to try to show you what, what that can look like for you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dave. It's a real pleasure to be here and I'm really excited to share with you how Urban Utilities has been um, rolling out this Safety 2 theory um, that Dave's spoken about. So um, Urban Utilities, we are the wonderful world of water and sewage uh, here in Brisbane. And we've been rolling out Safety 2 now for around two to three years. So that should be a really good indicator that this is not a quick fix. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, I would definitely be strapping in for the long ride. So uh, you might be looking at your organization and surveying the landscape. You've got a really good understanding of where your business is at and where your leaders are at. And you might be wondering then, okay, so how do I start to implement this? And for some of you, and some people I've spoken to in the past, they've said, look, I'm really daunted by this. I just don't think my leadership have an appetite for it. And I definitely understand where you're coming from there. And there's absolutely no reason why you can't take a different approach to what Urban Utilities has done. And you could very much ninja this in. You could drip feed it in. You don't even need to call it safety too. You could just start uh, using the language and talking about the concepts with your leaders. Now, when I joined Urban Utilities, it was a slightly different landscape. The door was open, so to speak. So the uh, executive team, the CEO and the board, they were asking for something contemporary, something quite new. So I went to them and I first of all introduced the broad concepts of safety differently and resilience engineering and some of the research. And, and they were really um, receptive to the idea. So that gave me a green light, if you like, to then go ahead and formulate a strategy. Now you can see on the slide there, there's a little bit of a, gra a graphic. It's a simple roadmap, which is um, a summary of the strategy that we've put in place. So going away and uh, formulating a strategy, my suggestion would be to wrap some kind of change model around it. So I'm a fan of Cotter's eight stages of change. There's ProSci, there's many out there. Um, but I would definitely see this as a safety transformation process. So if you can see that slide there, it might be a little bit hard to read. Um, distilled down into three stages, we did some discovery, we did some design and training, and then we implemented a number of tools there. You, you probably can't read it, but it talks about insights and learning teams. Um, what else have we got there? We've got um, some visual um, safety dashboards. We've got measurement differently, micro experiments and whatnot all toward the outcomes that we collaborated on with our leadership team. Now, I cannot overstate the importance of, if you've got something to introduce to your business, I cannot overstate the importance of doing some kind of training to get everyone on the same page. So if you've got something important that you want to tell them, you need to create an opportunity for your leaders to unpack the theory, to debate it, to think critically about it, um, and just to pull it apart and then to go away and apply it. So in that second stage, that's exactly what we did and what Dave alluded to. We did um, 
we, we, this is pre-COVID, mind you, uh, we pulled uh, all our leaders in to do um, this bespoke four-day safety leadership program that we wrote for the business. So what we did was we took all the theory from Eric Hobnagel, Sydney Decker, Dave Proven, Drew Ray, David Woods, and we really synthesized that down and put it into layman's terms. Now that's just a nice graphic representation of what the training covered off on. Um, and also in that training, we put in there uh, a bunch of tools and methodologies. So they would hear the, tra hear, the, hear the theory and then they could go away and actually put it into practice. So that included things like learning teams, work insights and micro experiments. Now we've called our training safe simple, but you could just insert, insert the name of choice into that. Um, but uh, yeah, again, I can't, I can't really overstate the importance of doing something to get them all in the same room and on the same page about the theory. Now, when people come to this training, it's so simple, you've got to understand that um, and appreciate that they've been socialized and indoctrinated, if you like, into a particular safety paradigm that can be quite traditional. And for some people, when they're hearing new things, it brings up a bunch of assumptions about safety that they may not even really consciously be aware of. So the caveat that we put out there in Safe Simple was that they may not like the theory, and that's okay, but to always be curious about what we're talking about, demand evidence and think critically, and to question everything. Um, and yeah, so they may not agree with what we're saying in that training, but certainly the invitation was there to go away and put it into practice and apply it. So the modules, there was four of them, um, and at the end of each module, they'd have a month to go away and put it into practice afterwards. So then they'd come back and they could tell us if they crashed and burned, put it into practice, if they had huge amounts of success, they were able to share those learnings and those failures with us. And then we were able to refine the tools even further. Um, we had about 200 leaders go through this particular training and we also invited our delivery partners as well, uh, which was really nice to have them along. So uh, the measure that we put into place um, for this, the pre and post, was a training transfer measure. Here is some of the anecdotal feedback that we got um, about the training. So some leaders said, look, this is uh, awesome and exciting content. I'm really keen to put it into good use. Um, some people said that they, you know, they laughed, which is great because we want to make safety really engaging as well, rather than being dry and, and, and heavy on the theory. They said it was a breath of fresh air. It should be run across the whole business. And then that last comment there, someone said that it's the best training they've done, which is great. They've said it's ridiculously interesting and on point. Now, um, four days is a big investment to have people come and be trained in this theory. So we want it to be ridiculously interesting, but we also want it to be ridiculously useful once they go away. And that's not just for the first month, but 12 months post training, we want them to still be using the tools and methodologies, right? So um, really making sure that it had that training transfer and that relevance to them once they left the room. Um, and that, that's, that's been a really big targeted point of the, of the training that they can actually go away and use those methodologies. So Dave, I'm going to pass back to you now to talk about one of the key tools that we can pull from the theory, which is work insights, which is what we introduced to Urban Utilities and that landed particularly well. So if you can explain to us that methodology and thinking behind work insights and why it does make it a more of an innovative and contemporary approach. So over to you, Dave, thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks Kim. Look, um, so, you know, Kim's been able to um, get her senior leaders engaged around the ideas, trained a whole bunch of people, inspired and motivated, expanded paradigms, created new mindsets in her organization. And then people go, okay, great. What do I do? How do I do this? Where do I start? My organization is not going to completely change the way it runs, um, um, it, you know, the next day when I, when I come into work. So it's about what are those first practical um, actions and practices um, and, and approaches that we can put in to support the, the mindset change and the approach change that we're trying to create. So one of the important things when we think about safety too, and when we try to create safety in, in our organizations is to understand that safety is an emergent property of the work. So good friend, someone like Peter Hudson at Cathay would say, you can't fix safety with safety. You have to fix safety by the way that work happens and give yourself a better chance of creating safety as an emergent property of, of that work process, which means that your object of understanding has to be work. Um, 
we don't look at safety. We don't understand safety. We look at work and we understand work. So when, when we think about the object of understanding being work, we need to go, well, maybe our safety inspections and our safety leadership visits and our safety audits and our safety incident investigations and our safety behavioral observations are trying to look at safety and we're missing this bigger picture of work and what we can learn from the way that work is actually happening. Um, so this idea of work as done versus work as imagined, I'm sure it won't be a new idea for people. And Kim's going to talk about that a little bit, but work insights at urban utilities. I love that name, by the way. Um, whenever people ask me, what am I going to do instead of like behavioral observations or inspections or something? It's a, I always say work insights, like, cause that's what it's about. What are the insights that we can get about work? that's going to inform better decisions, better resource allocation and better management in our businesses. So the starting point for putting safety to in practice to read off the slide is understanding work as done. So Kim, tell us about how you at Urban Utilities and the team at Urban Utilities understand and learn from work as done. Yeah. And uh, Dave, I'm gonna, before I do that, I'm gonna have to give Dave a big shout out for his Safety of Work podcast and for the research papers that Dave has published, because there's so much that can be drawn from them, which help inform what this work, is, um, work insights methodology looks like. So it's really all there for us on a platter. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> um, as safety practitioners, we're very, very lucky to have someone like yourself uh, putting that research out there that we can draw on. So yeah, that's exactly what we've done. Um, we've created this um, work insights process based on the theory and created this methodology. Now, I want to give you a, a really nice, uh, simple example of what a work insight is and looks like, and then I'll explain more about how we've applied that. So at Urban Utilities, um, we obviously treat all the wastewater and sewage that comes from Brisbane and surrounds. And, and at our sewage treatment plants, we have a number of inherent risks. One of the, our high-risk work activities is working around and in uh, working around water and we have a number of lagoons and ponds which contain some interesting materials uh, which you definitely wouldn't want to fall into because um, there's a drowning risk um, some of the water is aerated which again poses another risk so um, our guys they have to go into these inlets and ponds day in day out for all of their operational and maintenance work and we want to make sure that that area is secure as possible just in case there were any people who might stray onto site. We don't want them to be able to get into these areas. So we have a number of things in place. We have security fencing, as you can see there. We have safety signage. Um, we do a lot of work around ensuring that these areas are secure and safe. And the guys are really well aware of those, obviously aware of those risks. Now, someone, uh, a, a group of people who sit at the blunt end of the sticks, so the people who don't do the operational work, came up with an idea to say, look, we're just, you know, we want to make this really, really secure let's put locks, these green locks that you can see in the picture there, let's put locks on all of these gates. Now, our guys go in and out of these gates day in, day out, right, like multiple times. So what it then meant was they had to carry a whole bunch of keys with them and they were constantly having to unlock the locks day in, day out. Now, on a sewage treatment plant, you have low levels of H2S gas, which is well controlled for, but it can, uh, creates a very corrosive environment. So you can imagine that these locks and these keys jammed up pretty quick. Now, I'll, um, I'll ask you to think to you in your mind what the guys started doing, right? They're going in day in, day out. So of course, the locks just tended to sit there, either unlocked or locked. They were jammed up. Um, and our guys just would tend to shimmy through the gates when they could, or they would go over the gates or under the gates. Now, with an aging workforce, <laughs> that's really not a great behavior. It's quite unsafe, creates another set of risks. Also, if we were to have an incident inside those areas and we had to get emergency services in, again, that's, it's going to be hard because we not, might not be able to locate the key. So one of our HSRs, he was very frustrated by this. We just introduced the work insight process. So he went out to do a work insights on it. And when he came back, as he, he said was, um, he came back with the documented work insight that said, look, this is the work as imagined, the black line, which obviously there was good intent there to make it safer. But the blue line, the work is done, is that we're actually creating a whole bunch of unsafe behaviours and the locks have zero control toward the risk that we're trying to mitigate. So this HSR took it back to the toolbox talks, he took it back to the leadership, they did a number of risk assessments, there was a lot of discussion around this, and then they came collectively to the decision 
to get the bolt cutters out and cut the locks. Um, and obviously putting, making sure all those other controls were, were working in place. So that's a really nice, simple example of a work insight that looked at the work as imagined and what we were trying to achieve, but actually what was happening uh, and the work has done and how that, that blue line was starting to stray from the black line. Now, you might be thinking, well, why couldn't they have just gone out there and discovered that? Well, indeed, they could have. However, I don't think that the HSRs and the field workers were really empowered to go and do that. I think they saw that as something that had come from head, um, the head office and they didn't really feel empowered to go and change that. So I believe that the work insight process has been really great for our field workers because they can take control of situations and they can start to post things and escalate them upward to get some, some meaningful change and, and to enhance their operational safety. So work insights for us, this has landed particularly well. I would say that our field workers are the masters of this blue line that Dave spoke about. And when I go out and talk to the field workers and explain this concept of work as imagined and work as done, it instantly resonates with them. They, like the light bulbs go off instantly. Um, because they are the ones who are out there in the rain and the heat. They're the ones dealing with goal conflicts, the resource constraints, and that blue line that's going up and down there are all of those things that they absorb. It's that variability that they absorb day in, day out um, to create and make uh, safe production happen at urban utilities. So that really resonated with them, that language. Um, and then we rolled out this work insights process with our leaders. So the idea is, is that you don't go out there looking to catch people out because they're not adhering to the work as imagined. You go out there and you have a really curious conversation to find out how work is actually happening. Now, I think a really good marker of a good work insight, and when you know when this process is really working, is when you hear some really interesting, <laughs> perhaps concerning stories of how work actually happens. Now, underpinning that then, you need to have a certain level of trust and your response as a leader will matter when these work insights come past your desk. Because sometimes you might be alarmed by the drift and the gap that's occurring between the work as done and the work as imagined. Um, but then if you know about it, then that gives you as a leadership group an opportunity to then work with the workforce to close that gap and bring the work as done back to the work as imagined. So um, what we've done, we've uh, rolled this process out, we've trained people in the methodology and the thinking, we've set up the back end system so leaders can go out, do a work insight and record it, or anyone can do a work insight, sorry. Um, and then that comes back in through our system and I report this on a monthly basis, upward to the board and the executive team. And I report it in two ways, I report it quantitatively where I map it all the work insights against our high, our high risk activities. So they can see um, all the insights coming through there. We use just a really simple traffic light system. So they can see if there's any sort of red flags or areas that we're, we're diving into deeper. And I also report generally the work insights on a qualitative basis as well. And the reason why I do that, and it does make my report a little bit longer, is because there's so much rich data here that uh, as a leadership group we're particularly interested in because it's the stories behind the work as it's actually happening that is so useful. Um, so my suggestion would be is to, if you are thinking about rolling out um, and implementing some of this theory, or you may have already, I can't emphasize enough how um, useful this process is and how simple it is to actually implement. You can also then take that aggregated data um, as your system matures and you get more and more data through, you could then start to take that and use that on a quarterly or an annual basis to analyze with your, your leaders and your HSRs and your field workers to again proactively find those insights into, into how we improve operational safety. So Dave, back over to you to talk about the last point for today, which is around enabling safety and probably one of my favorite tools of decluttering. So over to you, Dave. Thanks, um, thanks, Kim. What I really like about Work Insights is the flexibility in how you apply that practice in your organisation. You can, you can start with a blank piece of paper and go out to work in, on, in your office, in the engineering team or the procurement team, or you can go out to site and look at work people do with a blank piece of paper and just say, you know, what are you doing? Tell me about it. 
and see what you can learn about the work and see what you can learn about your organization with that blank piece of paper. Or you can look at some of your key risk issues and, and high risk activities and go, I really want to understand work as done in relation to these type of activities. So I'm still going to go out there with a blank piece of paper. It's not about trying to figure out um, what's compliant and what's non-compliant. It's about, it's about descriptively learning. But I like the way that you can just use that approach, that ongoing inquiry, appreciative inquiry, ethnographic approach to just understanding the way your organization's mm -hmm. functioning. And I also love the way that you report it qualitatively. So when you've, when you've re, redesigned your, um, under measuring differently, redesigned your QUU dashboards, you know, like on the front page and in your dashboards, there's, there's thematic text, which tells your directors and your executives, um, you know, descriptive insights into what's happening in their business at the moment, rather than have all my leaders done four work insights this month, which is completely useless um, to make decisions um, anywhere in your organisation. So, it's so true, Dave. Um, and we have put a KPI on it just to try to advance the maturity, which I was really reticent to do. And we did put that one a month on it, but really we are looking for that, as you say, that quality over quantity. And it's been really interesting to see the topics that have come through. Like we have everything from chemical handling, manual handling, um, lockout, tagout, just the richness in the topics um, and how um, willing people are to throw forward their ideas and their frustrations around that, that work is done versus work is imagined gaps. So very, very true. And I think that's okay. I think building on um, the way that organizations function in regards to metrics, um, as long as you know what you, why you're using them and what you're doing them for, I, I'm a big believer that you have to get the activity started and then build quality into the process. If you try to get it perfect from day one and just expect people to use it all the time from day one when they've never done it before, I don't think you really understand human behavior and how organizations function. So, you know, as a transitional object, throwing a one a month target for the first year or two while you get the activity started and creating good feedback mechanisms to build quality mm -hmm. into the process as people are doing them and develop capability. And as soon as it's happening, as soon as it's part of your organization, then rip the target out and, um, and, and, you know, use the data um, that's coming from it. So I like that. So, so if we talk about um, safety too, being about having this broader perspective about how that we understand the way that work happens in our organization and how do we create um, an enabling environment for it to be successful. So as Eric would say, how do we make work go well more of the time than it doesn't go well um, is, is kind of this, this idea. And so we, we understand now through all of our work insights and understanding work has done, we, we start to develop a picture of the way that work happens, but we still, or and we still wanna create safety. We want safety to emerge from our organization every day and emerge from the way that we do work. So we are going to have safety management practices, if you like. There are things that we're going to do for safety um, when we're doing work so that we can try to create that, um, you know, those factors, those enablers, that prioritization, that resource allocation towards um, delivering the work outcome in a safe way. So this is where we start to look at all of the safety work we do across our organization. And um, thanks for the shout out, Kim. And there's a few comments there about um, Drew's work. And Drew and I wrote a paper a few years ago on safety work versus the safety of work. And, and that was really to get at what is the actual relationship between all of the safety work activities we do in our organization, the inspections, the audits, the investigations, the trainings, the inductions, the, um, the take fives, the permit systems. What is the relationship between all of these practices that are specifically trying to drive safety and safety of work and how safe the work actually is when people are doing it? And we tend to run in our organizations with, and the safety one sort of view runs with this kind of direct assumption that, you know, there's a causal link between the safety work activities and the safety of work. Um, and we're starting to unpack that a lot in the last couple of years and we're starting to learn about it. And we wrote another paper, um, Drew and I with our colleagues, um, Dr. David Weber and um, Sydney Decker about safety clutter. And that was trying to break down this, um, this safety work that doesn't, add any value to the safety of work. And in fact, sometimes actually makes work more dangerous. So without going into too much detail, our, our role in safety in terms of enabling um, successful work outcomes, which includes safety, is to, is to um, align our safety and operational practices and resources with the way his work has done, with a way of giving us a greater opportunity to create safety as an emerging outcome. So this is, this is where you need to have a look at everything you're doing in the name of safety in your organization and the value that it's contributing. So 
Kim and at Urban Utilities, you've been at this for, for a little while now to try to do um, decluttering on an organizational scale um, and have had some quite amazing and innovative successes uh, with how you're doing that. Yeah, thanks, Dave. And I must say, those two papers that you, <laughs> you already know this, Dave, but those two papers that you referenced, I cannot, um, I just, you know, when I read them, you can just, you can pull a whole strategy from those papers. Like, we're, they really are such valuable contributions to the safety industry, Dave. So, again, I'm not sure. Um, later on, you might want to tell us how, how we can get our hands on those two papers. Yeah. Um, I won't send through my version because it's got markups all through it. Dave, how can the audience get hold of those two papers? Yeah, look, as an author, you can distribute them. So, it looks like we've got 97 participants. I'm happy to receive 97 emails and I'll click, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll attach them. That. Um, I'll attach them and, and fire them back or send me a LinkedIn message or something. I'll make sure you can get your hands on, on anything you're yeah. looking for. Yeah, that'd be really great, Dave, because those two papers alone have just um, really helped guide our decluttering processes. And, and, another, and another sort of story that demonstrates that the model that you've got in those papers around safety work and safety of work and that interplay between aligning the practices. Um, some time ago, before I joined Urban Utilities, we rolled out this campaign called the Personal Big Five campaign. And you write down the five most important people, things or experiences to you. And that's why we invest in safety. And it wasn't a bad campaign and it landed well. Anyway, um, when I was um, um, starting to do a lot of this, this safety transformation work, uh, one of the leaders came to me and said, Kim, I really loved that Personal Big Five campaign. Um, It'd be really great if we got all of the field uniforms, uh, so our high vis uniforms, embroidered with that hand. And it says personal big five. So just as a little reminder to the guys to stay safe. Now, at the time I was reading a lot of your work, Dave, and so I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to apply this to the model here. And I can really see how it fit into that idea of social safety. So it shows when we're out in the workforce, uh, out in the community, that we care about safety because we obviously have it embroidered on our uniforms. And then I thought to myself, well, what's the cost of rolling this out? So if we had to do this new, let's say it might be 100K to get all the uniforms embroidered with this hand. So I thought just for a bit of fun here, I'll go and I'll talk to my uh, the field guys in the HSRs and I'll pitch this idea to them. And I said to them, look, you know, this is the idea. Should we put this PP5 hand on the uniforms? Will this help you be safer? Now, you can imagine the response that I got from the field workers, right? Uh, I got pretty much laughed at. And I, they said, well, Kim, how much you know, would that cost? And I, said, I told them the cost of it. And they said, well, actually, here's five ideas of how we could spend 100K to make our job safer. And none of them involved embroidering a hand on a uniform. So I really like that model that you've got in your papers there, Dave, around um, the different types of safety and whether those activities that we invest so much time and energy and money in actually improve operational safety. So that was our goal when we started to look at decluttering our safety management system. Our safety management system isn't bad. It's fairly bloated though. We had an enforceable undertaking about five years ago and we threw everything but the kitchen sink into the safety management system. So it did need quite a bit of work. So to start our decluttering process, I wanted to get really clear on what was, um, what was the interplay between the relationship between the safety management activities and the safety management system and frontline work and operational safety. So we invested in two things. The first one was a three month ethnographic study that we uh, did with, we partnered with the Safety Science Innovation Lab at Griffith University. Um, Dave, I remember you were involved in this study as well and Jop Havinga. And this was a great study. Jock went out and he was a field worker for three months. He was out in the, the heat with the guys, fixing burst water mains. He was on sewage treatment plants. He was at the lab just studying um, and seeing how the safety management system impacted them from a safety perspective. Now that report uh, we did in May 2019, I'm still using the insights from that. It was so rich in data that we've been able to use to inform our decluttering efforts. And then the second one um, that we did, which is our pre-measure, which we'll do on an annual basis just so we can um, track the uh, decluttering efforts and, how, and see if they're working, is the safety clutter scorecard. Now, Dave, do you want to just throw in a few words about the scorecard and um, how it works and where people can find it? Yeah, so um, we created this, Andrew Barrett um, and I, um, based on the early conversations that were happening around safety clutter, put a put a scorecard up there, which just lets you go through some questions about um, how cluttered your organization is and looking at typical safety practices and the extent to which you think they contribute to operational safety. So 
Um, so it just lets you do some scoring, you get a report back and it just helps you start a conversation in your organization. It's always curious when, you know, we've, Urban Utilities did the, did the survey and you can see what managers think and you can see what, um, what workers think, you can see what safety professionals think. We've done it with another, a couple of other large organizations because at the end of the day, kind of what matters in, in safety a lot is, um, you know, when people are doing these practices, you know, what, what are they, what are they, what are they thinking or what are they, what, you know, what quality are they building into their approach and what are they trying to achieve and what are they getting out of it? So, and how aligned is the organization around that? So I think it's a great opportunity. It's there, safetyclutter.com. You can dive in um, and um, let us know if you have any problems with um, trying to access or trying to do it. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, because I think that's something that um, boards and executive teams are interested in is, well, let's track the measurement, let, let's track the progress and the impact of this. So this scorecard's a really simple way to track your the impact of your decluttering efforts. So you can see on the right there, that little graphic. So that was one of the results that we got from the safety clutter scorecard. And what that's telling us is the guys in the field have ranked all the safety activities that we invest in. And obviously number one being the activity that impacts their, their safety the most. And number 23 is the, is the, impact, uh, the activity that impacts them the least. So this was a really um, good insight for us. It just confirmed what we, we probably knew for some things, but there, there were a few additional surprises in there as well. So a lockout tag out, that um, particular procedure needed a massive overhaul, which we've been doing now for uh, the last six months. Um, verification of competency, um, inspections, audits, fatigue management was another big one. So we really probably put a lot of our time and energy into cluttering into those top 12 um, activities and we'll eventually make our way down the list. Now, um, as a health and safety uh, manager, I do spend a little bit of time on preparing for board and executive safety visits, which the guys are telling us that doesn't contribute anything at all uh, to their operational safety, which is no surprises. So that was uh, an interesting um, little output of the safety clutter scorecard. So I want to give an example of something that we have decluttered. So um, a lot of frustration comes from um, our field guys in relation to written risk assessments. So uh, I just want to put a caveat here to say risk assessments, of course, are 100% essential. And we, the aim is we want our guys doing thorough risk assessments on each job and making sure all of those risks are well mitigated and controlled for. Our guys do a lot of routine work day in, day out. And obviously we have, like many organisations do, the written component of that risk assessment. And this is what came back in some of our, our ethnographic research and um, surveys. A lot of the guys said, look, there's no value to this. This is just an us covering activity. It's a long process we do every day. Sometimes we sit in the truck and we just, um, you know, we, do, we, do, we do the tick and flick um, and we just predate them and whatnot. And obviously that's um, concerning to us. We wanted to make sure that they were doing a, a thorough risk assessment, which they were, they just weren't doing it in the prescribed fashion of the written risk assessment. So what we did was working with the guys um, through the collaboration and participation process, we redesigned the written risk assessment to become what we called the conversational tool, the chat. So for routine tasks, we removed the written component of the risk assessment and we moved to a conversational tool where they still do that same risk assessment, but they just don't have that need to document it. So this is some of the collateral that we produced uh, for the chat, which we rolled out. There was a verification of competency piece as well um, before they could start commencing and, and using the chat. Now, um, that's, and Dave, you might be able to talk to this a bit better than I can, but um, there is that part of decluttering where you need to understand what each stakeholder thinks of that decluttering process or how much value and contribution does that safety activity add. So while that was the feedback from the guys, there was obviously um, a need from other stakeholders to say, well, hang on a second, if we remove that written component of a risk assessment for routine tasks, where does that leave us from a legally defensible position? Now that's a really valid concern from that stakeholder group. So what we did was, we went to our favorite safety lawyer, Michael Toomer from Clyde & Co, and we got some written advice from him around whether it was uh, legally okay to remove that written component of the risk assessment for routine tasks. And here's uh, the quote from Michael Toomer's report where he said, look, there's no, written, no express obligation to implement documented risk management processes in the Act, uh, regulations or codes of practice, whatever obligation exists relates to proactively managing the risks. 
which is what we, um, our guys do do on a regular ba uh, on a day to day basis, and we're ensuring that they do do. Now he went on to say that documentation of the process is only necessary if it assists in the traceability of implementation of risk controls and the review of the effectiveness of those controls. So we split our risk assessment into different levels. So there's the um, the decluttered a verbal risk assessment that they do. And then we have a written component of the risk assessment for the complex and specialist tasks relating to their swims and, and the change in controls. So that particular um, initiative has landed really well. The guys have said, look, this is the best thing that safety's ever done, uh, which was great feedback from them. Um, but we're, we're feeling in a better position to go, look, now they're spending that time when they would have been in the truck just ticking and flicking. They're actually out there now investing that, that time um, in doing that thorough risk assessment. So I do suggest um, in some cases when you are decluttering is to also consider that legal component of it because oftentimes we put things into play thinking that we're doing it to satisfy the legal side of it when in actual fact we're probably just maybe in some cases over baking it. Um, so that's decluttering um, in a nutshell and what we've done. It's obviously a long process for us. I wouldn't say that we're hugely down the road on it. We're probably 25, 30% down the road now decluttering efforts. It's definitely a long-term project that we'll have in place for some time. Dave, did you want to add anything else in terms of decluttering there and advice for businesses as they undertake it? Yeah, look, I think we asked people um, in the scorecard, we're getting quite some data now. We've had uh, maybe three or 400 people, 500 people do the scorecard. And, and you know, when we ask people, what are they concerned about with um, removing some of the safety work activities in their business? And what's interesting is, um, and it's largely safety professionals who fill this out. I'm assuming it's largely going to be safe, people involved in the safety profession on this call. But um, people tend to feel twice as worried about maintain about their legal obligations as they are actually keeping people safe so people in terms of what what would stop you from decluttering or uh, risk of um you know legal um consequences is ranked twice as high as what would stop you from decluttering or i might remove something that's actually keeping people safe mm -hmm. so there's a real need for us i think in the safety profession with safety one and safety two and with how work happens work has done versus how we imagine it in our safety systems and you know, safety work versus the safety of work to go, our primary purpose is our primary customers are the people who are exposed to the risk and working with them to keep people safe. Yeah, through line management a lot of the time, but working to keep them safe. And our primary concern should always be, what do they need to get their work done and get their work done safely? Exactly, Dave. I couldn't have put it better myself. And I, I think that's a nice wrap up to today's webinar. Um, is to say, look, what we're really talking about here is how we marry up the theory with the practical and how you interpret that for your business. And the whole reason why we do it, as Dave just said, is so that we can reinforce that principle of safety is an ethical responsibility to all employees in our workforce, not just a bureaucratic accountability for a few people. And that's what I truly believe and what really drives us at Urban Utilities is to ensure that we have that at the forefront, is that safety truly is that ethical responsibility. So I'm going to uh, play a short promo video. It's nothing short of just entertaining. <laughs> There's no intellectual or, or informative value there. This is just a, a nice little fun video we put together as part of our training. And while that video is playing, I'll invite you to go to the Q&A box there. Throw all your questions up. I think we've got around another 15 minutes where Dave and I will be online and we can answer your questions. So thanks so much. Right. Thank you. Um, you'll need that time for these questions. Okay. So um, thanks, Kim. Uh, David asks, are there any specific systems that should be in place as a starting point for getting into safety too? Um, and he suggests risk management system ISO standards. Um, look, I, 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 I don't know. Um, I think every organisation is different. We'd like to think that um, nothing stops any organization with wherever it's at having a broader perspective about how work happens because regardless of your starting point from a safety point of view risk management systems iso standards people are getting work done every day and people are you know trying not to kill themselves in the process so you know I, you could almost make an argument or i could almost make an argument that, that starting with a broader perspective about how work happens and then building valuable safety practices to to support that and enable that may be a better starting point um, for you than um, building a, a base safety management system. Um, but look, 
as, as, as organizations go down this pathway, we're going to learn more about that. Um, you definitely need to have a couple of things in your enabling environment. You need to have trust um, in your business and you need to have open communication and, um, and some of those types of things because they're probably going to be the biggest limiters on your improvements in this space than what formal safety systems you've got at the start. Okay. Uh, Peter asks, it would help me to better understand if safety two is the same as safety differently in concept. He's confused by the language being crossed over. Okay. Um, Kim, uh, look, uh, from, my, from my perspective, there's, there's, there's four or five um, labels on this from high reliability organization to resilience engineering, to hop to safety two, to safety differently. And there's a Venn diagram that has probably, you know, my perspective, 70, 80% overlap in, in all of these types of ideas. Um, Differences, I, all I'm going to say is that's my opinion. There's differences of opinion from the different theorists about, about the similarities and differences in their approaches. I tend to use the time, the terms at times interchangeably because safety two as opposed to safety one and safety differently as opposed to safety traditionally. Um, so, yeah, it's a probably a longer discussion point than right now, and there's lots of different opinions. Kim, you know, do you, do you tend to use the terms interchangeably or? Yeah, I do use the terms interchangeably, yeah. Dave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, a learning that I had from rolling this out at Urban Utilities was that, um, you know, if I was to go into another organisation to do this, I probably wouldn't use the term safety two and safety one because I think it becomes a little bit polarising for people. Um, yeah, I think it's maybe all semantics then at the end of the day, though, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I do. Okay, um, Kevin's got a question, but I'm a little bit confused. So I'm going to ask him to clarify that, um, his uh, previous question to Drew Ray. So Kevin, if you can do that. Roberto asks, is your, in your safety two implementation, how did you define safety to your top leaders? So which question is that one? It's the one from Roberto. It's the second question. I'm just going to skip the one at the top. In your safety two implementation, how did you define oh, safety to you. your... Yeah, so um, we, as part of Safe Simple, we took the um, definition of safety from safety to literature, which really flips the definition, and we posed that to them. We did that more as an interactive activity, so really posed it to leaders. Hey, how do you traditionally view safety? Um, and then what's an alternative definition of safety being around, obviously, adaptive capacity as opposed to looking at it from a deficit model? So um, that... that um, landed really well with them and helped shift the paradigm around to how we traditionally view safety and how we could view it differently. Okay, Josh asks, with Work Insights, how is the data actually collected? Do you use a form? Is it electronic? Is it collected in the field? Or do the conversations happen and the information is collected later? Yeah, uh, yeah so Josh, happy to share with you um, in more detail about this um, after the, the webinar. Um, so yes, it is collected electronically. Um, we have an app-based system as well, so that we can either use it, you know, on your desktop computer or through the app. Um, all the questions are set up for the leaders, so you can just do it out there in the field, or you can come back and fill it in. And then obviously that's aggregating upwards through our um, information, our system, information system, um, that we can then use for reporting. But prior to having that set up, we just had the good old paper and pen, but certainly having it electronically available. Um, it's valuable. Okay. Um, Klaus is asking about those two papers and um, yep. maybe we can um, sort out something as well yep. in the email after. Um, so questions for David from Siam Saul. Uh, what are the key differences between safety two and high reliability organisation or are they similar in concept to each other? So they are similar in concept to each other. High reliability organisation theory was the first safety theory to look at Safety is the presence of capacity within an organization. And there's five, the most famous kind of interpretation of that from um, Carl Wyke and Jade Sutcliffe is, um, is the five elements of, of high reliability organization. So it's, it's similar in a sense is that safety two is looking for the capacities in an organization that make uh, work go well. It's just that HRA theory is labeled five of what they think are the key capacities. So um, very similar concepts in my opinion. Um, he also says, I have the impression that safety too is just a perspective change on how we see worker safety operations still need to have a strong safety one foundation before starting implementation. What's your opinion? 
Yeah, so there's a few things here. Do you need to have a strong safety one foundation? I'd say no. Um, but what you need to have in your organization is some level of dependable role performance. And this is sort of in the management literature in the 1960s. If you've got a group of people who are working towards common objectives in your organization, they need to know how each other's going to perform, approach their work tasks so that you can work the integration and the, the relationships and the handoff points in processes and things like that. You can't have an organization where everyone turns up and makes every decision every day about you know, how, the, how they're going to do that. So if that's what people think about when they think about safety one, how can I get repeatable and dependable and reliable role performance? You always want that. What safety two would put on top of that is just say, don't assume tomorrow is going to be like today. And don't assume that the way you've been performing your role today is going to match the conditions that people face tomorrow. So while you want to always build and learn on your base of the way that your organization functions and operates, you always got to remain sensitive to the possibility of, of change and, um, and, and something being different. So, so you will build dependability into your organization with a safety to approach. Okay. He also says the work as done versus work as imagined graph. The X axis is for time. What is the Y axis for? Is it for performance safety and how to measure them? How do you score the plus and minus for it? Okay, so um, I don't know how to score them or if you'd ever be able to score them. So the blue line, black line graph is, um, the black line is the rigid fixed view of the procedure or the way that work happens. And it's sort of like the system says the work happens the same way every day. And the blue line is the reality of performance variability of just how work changes dynamically every time a task is performed. Now, this is a, this is a simplification of a Rasmussen graph from the late 90s about dynamic risk modeling which talks about boundaries. So when that blue line's moving up and down, when Eric Holnagel would put the slide on a screen, he'd have some imaginary red lines which says, your performance can vary as much as you want away from that black line until it hits the, the margin for safety. And that's when an incident um, or a near miss sort of occurs. The problem is you don't, it, it's not always easy to know where that boundary sits until you've crossed it. So I don't know how to measure it um, Samuel's all other than doing work insights and trying to understand just how far the work is from, um, from how the work is perceived to normally be done and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for safety. Okay, um, Roberto asks, how did you bring the regulator to buy into safety too? I just answered that uh, one for, also for Jan as well, so we actually, um, Ran a safety innovation roundtable where we where we invited the regu um, the regulator and some representatives from academia and some representatives from industry just to open up that conversation around safety innovation, i.e., doing things like safety two in Queensland. Um, we ran that in 2019. Uh, we also have fairly obviously good relationships that we've built with the regulator, and we um, have spoken to them a few times around. Um, some of the tools and practices that we have in place. So just through relationship management and time, really. Okay. Um, Mark asks for Kim, how do you manage when someone in the leadership team changes and is firmly entrenched in BBS or safety one only approach? Yeah. Hey, Mark. Uh, so I found from formulating the strategy and then bringing the leaders in to that training framework through Safe Simple, I found that that really helped bring the leadership cohort through that process of thinking together. Um, so I, one of our executive leaders was, you know, he would often push back on me and say, Kim, you know, and he had the Heinrich Triangle drawing his whiteboard behind him. We'd often have little debates in his office about that. Um, and he was really one of our biggest champions. So I think, um, for me, the answer lies in just that relationship and being able to debate it and, and, and not being scared of people um, refuting it or not liking it. That's okay. That's, you know, their opinion and their prerogative. I think what's harder is when then you have a change in executive. So they haven't been brought on that journey, that cultural journey that the organisations come through. They've come in new now to a position. Then you have to figure out, well, okay, well, how, how are we going to get that person um, on board and across all of this stuff. And again, that just takes some time. I don't have a, an answer for that really. Yeah. Okay, Cam asks, how are you continuing to obtain work insights and have curious conversations on site with COVID-19 travel and site and number restrictions, maybe not so much in Queensland, but definitely in Melbourne. 
Yeah, so our learning teams and working sites, the numbers went down uh, when COVID first hit. We stopped running learning teams because we prefer to run them face to face. It's picked up more. Um, it was probably um, it's picked up more since then. Um, it's, it's probably a little bit easier for us because we are critical services. So our sites are still running, all our responsive work's still running. So leaders can still be out there as they are for their supervision and whatnot, and they can they can still do work in sites, but definitely the number has dropped. We started running learning teams via Microsoft Teams, and that um, you know it's not as good as face to face, but it's a good measure for our new normal, um, a good way of doing it for our new normal. So yeah, but we definitely did reduce the number of them. Andy asks, what comes next, guys, when executives want something new and flashy? Maybe Angie could answer that for us. <laughs> well, Dave, do you want to have a go at answering that one before I do? Um, I'll just plug the Safety of Work podcast. I think the next episode that comes out next week is um, Drew and I talk about management fads and fashions, which is a whole discipline within organisational theory about how fads and fashions in management actually cycle through organisations over time. So um, there will be something new and flashy. Uh, it'll typically be something that's not actually new. That's a that's a morph of something that was probably done 20 years ago, um, with some new narratives and some new ideas over the top of it. So, um, I don't think there's anything really new and flashy um, in our safety theory. Um, Kevin, sorry, uh, sorry. And his comment then, you know, and I would, um, you know, that's. You know, I think that's where Dave's model around the safety of work can be useful to um, use to pace out if there was a request for something new and flashy to pace it out to go well, and then really unpack the question of why would we want something new and flashy? Um, what is the evidence? What is the research saying as to what actually works and lands and, and actually makes a difference? Um, so I'd probably go in and sort of debate that one a little bit. Uh, Kevin says, any thoughts on whether there are real differences in how to look at safety clutter in the defence industry? I don't know. Um, I don't think there's any problem with the decluttering process, which is look at all of the things you're doing for safety and the, con the contribution it makes to the safety of work, um, the, com the confidence. So, so why you have that view, do you have data which shows that relationship and then the consensus, which is getting all the stakeholders together around you know, the, the confidence and the contribution around that, that piece of work. So the process should apply. I don't know what other political and social um, and organisational drivers that may change um, what we might do. Okay. Um, I was going to answer, sorry, Sarah, I was going to answer Tan, Tanya's, oh, Tanya's question. <laughs> I had something for Tanya. So Tanya asked the question about, um, about have you seen organisations start to go down the path of these practices and stop? And the answer is yes. And there are two reasons that you will be derailed in safety to implementation in your organization. One is management change, where you get senior powerful people in your organization who have a different view and change and, and, and change the direction for the organization. And two is if your incident rates or you have a fatality and management then get really cold feet about continuing on that journey and revert to a more traditional type. So down this path, we've seen organizations um, completely changed their approach from going down the path of safety to back to safety one because of management change and incidents. Yeah, sorry, Dave, I'm just getting mouse happy. Um, That's cool. So um, the, the other question that's interesting here is, is, oh, the case study, Michelle asked, do you have a brief case study that we could use to pitch to executives? Yeah, um, doing safety differently video on YouTube starring Kim Bancroft. Yeah, I think we might put a link to that in the email. It's um, it's really good. I also recommend the first of those. So there's uh, that is a three part, um, there's three documentaries in that series, and the first one's really good as well, um, which can help Michelle um, if you are taking this to your board and executives, just to show that documentary, that first one as well. It's particularly good. That landed really well with with my ex. Okay, just one more um, from also from Michelle. Can you please help me to understand the way to evaluate the outcomes of introducing safety two to the organisation? Look, I think um, when I talk about evaluating the outcomes, um, you can either put some specific measures in place about the things that you want to that you want to um, that you want to see in your organisation to try to figure out how to measure those specific 
things that you're trying to change. Or I think you could probably defer to your employee engagement surveys because the types of things that you'll, you might have an impact on about my manager listens to me, my manager provides the resources I need to do my job, my, under, my manager understands the way that work happens in my company. So all of those questions in a typical engagement survey are the things that um, you would expect to see improve with a safety to approach to safety. Okay. Um... Peter says, seems to think that in your background, David, there is a safety lesson. Um, I don't know if it's oh, got yeah. a little that rocket. Five. Yes, that's my <laughs> Lego. That's what I do. That's what I do in between webinars. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and Peter says Saturn V was launched 13 times from the Kennedy Space Center with no loss of crew or payload. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, I think that wraps up all the questions. So um, thank you. Uh, Yes, I really like to thank David and Kim for coming along today. It's it's fantastic information. We'll try and get as much links and information in the email afterwards as well, and hopefully we can um, look at another topic down the track. So thanks, guys. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Bye. See ya.